For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. So they look to molecular clocks and DNA function. That's why the ALUs you talk about or the ERVs, for example, the fact that they're highly functional DNA elements, that's... Um, that's certainly consistent with this model of, as, as you love to hear me say, created heterozygosity. When How do you explain can we expect that? Adam I'll, I'll ask this one genome. last question, then you go back, and then it'll be your turn. How do you explain the um, the functional roles found in these? I like to call them variation-inducing genetic elements. You'll say they're ancient remnants of, of viruses and parasites, but how do you explain the uh, the function? In um, what do you mean? How do I explain the function? Which which one did you have in mind? Uh, okay, so if we're looking at, for example, why don't we look at um, in, in endogenous retroviruses? Okay. So we know that they are um, that they're playing important roles in um, in determining. You, you admit uh, they're viruses, right? Um, well, I would say it's well. I mean, like I said, I call them uh, variation-inducing genetic elements based on their uh, function. Yeah, but are do they are they are they viruses? Well, I mean, we know that viruses, for the most part within us are, are beneficial. We have more viruses than we do bacteria and cells. So point is, are they created uh, units of DNA as we would predict? And I would say that the, evi the evidence does suggest it. Now you probably looked at the several papers that I, um, that I had um, screen. Not yet, I don't, uh, I don't have the screen up to where yeah. I can see what those are. Oh, you didn't see the, okay, so I had those screen. Well, uh, uh, believe it or not, it's very difficult to just copy crap off that I see flip by at 900 miles an hour. Um, uh, well, well, you, you, let, let me ask you this. You well, have yeah, this, you all this information. The question. Uh, I could go on and on with these papers. I'll just read one line and then have you explain it. So this one says ERVs frequently act to distribute regulatory information and thus confer genes with new patterns of expression and function. Um, yeah. So, so for example, is, is, would your argument be okay? These ERVs that have crucial functions in regulating genes, determining cell types, they were co-opted. Like, do you, or do you have an original thought of your own or is you just going to go with the author's conclusion? Oh! Uh, I'll go with what the scientists say on it. It's their field. They're the ones with the PhDs. They're the ones with the actual uh, pedigree. Uh, are you going to override them because you have a dogma okay. involved? Okay. Well, as far as I can, let me ask you a question. As oh, far uh, as I know, okay. as far as I know, all the endogenous retroviruses are called retroviruses because they start out as viruses, not as some originally created design thing. Now, if you want to present right. a monograph that establishes that the virus quality of them isn't in fact a virus, uh, we look forward to your monograph on that. And don't just try to against it. I appreciate you saying that. That's why I said the question is, are these really the remnants of ancient viral infections or ancient parasitic um, infections and invasions, yeah, for example, or different. are they created units of DNA function? This is what I find funny, RJ. Okay, I'll ask you two questions, and if you want, you can go on to ask me questions. I appreciate that this is a little more respectful. Okay, so there's a class of retrotransposons. If you've seen my debates before, I've asked this before, maybe you're prepared for it. So this certain class of retrotransposons is found in the mouse embryo. Now, if you deactivate it, the mouse, the mouse embryo will develop, and then suddenly it stops. Well, why? It's because it depends on the function of these retrotransposons, which evolutionists used to say were non-functional evolutionary leftovers, and supposedly these functions were co-opted. If that's the case, what, were mice just not having kids for millions and millions of years?
how would you how would you explain that if these if these mice need these retrotransposons for development? Who says that's evidence that of DNA? It's the whole point is that lots of retroviruses, ALUs among others, can take on functionality. The question is, do all of them do that? For I I have a paper as well that I was just looking up today. Uh, infection by porcine endogenous retrovirus after islet uh, xenotransplantation in SCID mice, where they were establishing that we need to worry about uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, pigs as uh, organ donors and others, because there are retroviruses in there that when transplanted into mice can take on their old viral functions and do bad shit. Well, I, it's perfectly understandable that such things okay, wait, happen. Wait, slow down. Repeat that last part. What did they that do? that designed? Well, wait a minute. What did they do? They implanted a virus into the they, mouse they embryo? Took, they took the elements of the pig and transplanted it into, uh, without any modification, and okay. it takes on its old viral function again. What was the viral function? Something negative? Uh, mo a lot of viruses, well, from the virus's point of view, it's all positive. <laughs> but that, that's well, right, right. For us. But I mean, so... Could you, and you don't have to do it now, do you mm -hmm. have any papers, and we don't even have to, it doesn't have to just be the ERVs, it could be any class of retrotranspose on any signs, lines, whatever, ALUs. Do you have any paper that actually shows empirically that a non-functional, whether it's an ERV, whatever, went from non-functional to functional? And then I can look at that and, and see, okay, you know, here's, here's- Ew, Erica said you would bring that up. But I'm also not a geneticist and not kind of, that's not really my world. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be the first one to admit that I'm not a geneticist. Ah! Yeah, I'm not a geneticist. Ah! Genetics is not my forefront. Because ah! I'm not a geneticist. Ah! Again, not a geneticist. Ah! Then I'm not a geneticist. Ah! So I'm not a biochemist. Ah! I'm not a geneticist. Ah! And I'm not very well versed in genetics. Ah! Fine, because I got my notes right here because I don't know enough about genetics. Ah! Again, I, I cannot emphasize enough how this is not my field ah! as I continued to kind of begrudgingly admit throughout the course of this conversation that genetics really isn't kind of my field. Ah! Um, I can talk to you a lot about, you know, other stuff, but genetics isn't it. Ah! I don't know about because this isn't my field. Ah! Genetics really isn't kind of my field. Ah! I'm not a geneticist. Ah! Uh, that's not my field. I wish I could give you a better answer. Ah! I can't give you great answers because I don't know them. Oh, idiot. So what was the answer she told you to give me? Because if they're accomplishing crucial functions in regulating gene expression, differentiation, and development, I want to see a paper on how these functions can actually be um, co-opted. Because it seems like the evolutionists, and, and unfortunately, RJ, it seems like you've lost one of your favorite pieces of evidence. So would yeah, you have I a know. That, that's, that? that's the argument we go into. And this was not going to be a program on endogenous retroviruses. So I'm well, not yeah, prepared for that. <laughs> okay, but I don't have that. Well, you asked, thing. This was about human evolution, Adam and Eve and Noah. And right. I'm hoping to get onto that world. The reason Wait. why I brought the subject up, in fact, was that nobody in the creationist worldview has thought about this matter of the population of the new world. And this new paper of Jensen, I'm going to be really wanting to see whether he Papers. does any better Marvel. on that. They don't bother thinking through all of that because the people who wrote the Bible didn't give a rat's ass for anybody out of their framework. All of that stuff didn't exist. They didn't even know it existed. So there was no framework now. for them to go on. But here's my here's what I find weird. You asked John, you've asked multiple creationists, and that's why I was excited to have this debate. You asked yep. Adam and Eve, were they created with ERVs, ALUs, and these classes of retrotransposons? And now that I've cornered you on the topic, you're saying you're not prepared. Well, oh, why did you I, ask? I, I, will, I, I, will, I will go on at that issue about whether Adam and Eve had them. Do you know anybody, Jensen, Tompkins, Carter, Sanford, who has laid out what the original genomes of Adam and Eve needed to be in order to account for the heterozygosity of the hypothetical Noah and the kids, let alone all of the current ones. It's only 6,000 years. That's not that long ago. That's a, a relative snap for mm -hmm. uh, paleogenomics tinkering uh, with that short of a time frame. Uh, what was your question? You, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was actually just talking to Jensen the other day about these uh, variation-inducing genetic elements, the ALUs, the ER ERVs, and I was asking him, you know, how many of these do you think uh, were created initially in, in Adam and Eve? But th the fact is, and he, and he uh, directed me to a, a paper, a really highly technical paper that I can um, uh, that I can, I can pass on to you. But the fact oh, that these are all functional. And was that by a creationist or a, a regular science paper? 
No, no, this one would be uh, from Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. But the function, the function is key. DNA function, molecular clocks. The function I've showed you that, well, I mean, for one, if viral DNA is inserted, as you were talking about, at random into the genome, and that's why I asked you if that change in the paper you were talking about was negative, it's more likely to disrupt existing genes. I told uh, conspiracy cats this. I said if a blindfolded painter, uh, he's going to most likely mess up the painting he is working on just by applying random brush strokes to it. So these functional roles, there's no paper out there that shows them being being co Therefore, we can safely say that all of these uh, retro well, the reason why I bring up ALUs is that the vast majority of the ALUs that become functional are disease causers. Okay, of course. There, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually. So, <laughs> well, the ALUs are a little bit um th th that seems to be your expertise so you know we'll, we'll stick on that we'll stick on that there uh so these alu sequences they're they're what they're, they're small repetitive elements representing how much percent of, of our genome 10 percent. 10 percent. now 1. they have the ability million of them and counting how much 1.4 million of them and counting okay okay now because of their now from the papers i've read and i've read a few over the um over the last week and it seems that, that they always assert, so they'll say in these papers, and then once again, I'll pass those to James, they say, because of their ability to move around the genome, these jumping genes are considered as real motors of evolution. That's all they say, considered as real motors of evolution when uh, going over the, the functional roles that they have, because they talk about how the ALUs um, can allow cells to adapt to stress um, for example, during viral infection. But like you said, they lead to disease. Well, that's what we would expect, James. If they're functional DNA elements and they're mutated, for example, or something negative happens to them, of course they're going to lead to disease. Would you expect it any other way? Yeah, so when exactly would the first disease-bearing... Uh, the reason why most ALUs don't do a damn thing is because they don't have a readme code. That's why they're, they're functionally invisible, and that's why they can replicate. That's why there's so many of them. That Otherwise, we'd be up shit creek. Uh, a few fitted into our brain chemistry. That's one of the notable areas where they took on a functionality. Uh, but most of the time, they're gumming things up because they're gumming up protein sequences. Now, is it a design defect of the designer to have put in a system that has a, a copy me signal like that that just runs amok? Uh, it, can, can we sue? Well, I, I would say that that copy me signal, those those duplications, assist in what I've been saying in variation. These are variation in inducing genetic elements is it and reasonable causing diseases of course so the, so the designer was okay rj with causing diseases but uh, dna repair mechanisms dna redundancy for example requires forward thinking and i asked erica that question how does evolution how does natural selection which sees the the short term not the long term how does natural selection evolve something that requires forward thinking how does natural selection evolve well, a I, I think you have, may have an odd idea of what forward thinking applies in this case and we're kind of well, far away it we use stipulate that no creationist has worked out what adam and eve's genome was is that no correct? no no actually i'm going to send you so dr john sanford and robert carter are working on it i think they've actually uh, 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 but they haven't done it yet is that correct well it's a work in progress we understand okay. very little of the, is that the going to be is part. that going to be like like uh, chadwick working out the paleo uh, uh, world is that a coming attraction that's never going to oh, come I, I do want to answer that question, but I want you to, to answer this. Is it reasonable yeah. for us, RJ, to believe that these so-called ancient viruses and ancient parasites, the ALUs, possess the genetic information necessary to promote so many genetic functions and so many biochemical functions in human beings? I, I don't, accept your, I don't accept your supposition. What, what about ALU do you think is like forward designing? No, no. Well, you, you were saying um, with the um, with the mutations, for example, you're saying is this a is this a DNA error or is this an error in the design? Yeah, that's what you said. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So you obviously, don't allow errors in design, right? Well, obviously, if Adam and Eve were created with a perfect perfect genomes with uh, pre existing functional DNA differences, right. you do not allow on. imperfection of design in principle. Is that correct? In, in well, no, I mean, we see we see defect. Like, for example, my car coming off the assembly line was uh, near perfect. Now the air conditioner is broken down and rust is building up on the car. But Which means, as I mean said, you no do designer. not conceptually allow for imperfect design in principle. I just, I mean, it's a, it's a standard no, creationist. No. I don't know of any anti evolutionist that. Yeah, that but you're familiar creation. with genetic entropy, RJ. We don't have to go down that route. We, you know, we, I've said this before, so you, you're kind of, this is going to be a rabbit trail, but we accumulate 100 new mutations 
per person per generation. Take that accumulating mutational load back to a point of least mutation accumulation load. That's a perfect, that's a, a point of uh, perfect genetics, Adam and Eve. So yeah, after the fall, mutations have been introduced into the genetics of people and species. And now these ALUs, these ERVs, if they're subject to mutations, that will result in, of course, disease. But before we end, you asked me, have they worked out the original genomes? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's why I went over the, actually, no, I didn't have time with you, but I've asked before. They're looking at, because we know human chromosomes are, are made up of relatively large linkage blocks. And uh, Dr. Sanford, and you can look at this in the HapMap data, they're looking and analyzing these original text strings. And it shows us that the genome is young. Why? Why? And then I'll let you respond. Because the genome has only been partially scrambled. When in fact, RJ, crossovers and gene conversions should scramble all linkage bl blocks quite quickly in an evolutionary time frame. That's a huge problem for you. Answer that question and I'll tell you how they're using that data who, to come who, up with who the original. Who says that that's the problem? Is it stuff that Sanford says it's the problem? Or do you have a regular scientist that says it's a problem? Good question. Good question. Regular scientists and they have explanations for it. Do you know what the explanations are for it? Oh, well, summarize it because I write off the bat. I, I can't. So you summarize in the way that you didn't summarize Ventura's paper. Summarize this one for real. Well, I, well, I did summarize the Ventura paper. They say that the uh, sequences have been lost due to deep time. Time dependency did it. Oh, OK. As the evolutionists would say, God did it. Okay, well, real quick before we end. So they're looking at those linkage blocks. And since they're so, uh, they're still so large, that means there hasn't been much gene conversion or recombination going on. They can actually determine the original uh, chromosome, the original linkage blocks, and they're doing phenomenal uh, work in it. And Dr. Jensen's looking at it through uh, mitochondrial DNA differences, and they're close. Oh!